Welcome to the very first episode of the Fruity Knitting Podcast. I'm Andrea and I'm holidaying in North Wales at the moment and I'm upstairs in this stone cottage which we hired and it has such a beautiful little um, window here. I thought this is the perfect place to do a podcast. And I don't know if you can see but it's there's a, an old graveyard at the back and it's just a beautiful view and then there's a river which is very full because it's just been raining and there's even some sheep over there. So welcome and I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about my history. I'm an Australian, I'm actually living in Germany at the moment um, and I was taught to knit around the age of six or seven by both my mother and my grandmother and they were pretty competent knitters and I can remember loving clothes even from an early age so I was quite interested in knitting clothes for my dolls or even knitting clothes for myself but they decided that my very first project should be a rug knitted out of autumn leaves and the autumn leaves were knitted in a triangle so roughly like this and you had to knit a lot of them and then so one, the tip would be this way, and then the next one, the tip would be this way, and you'd just sew them all together so they'd end up in, in panels. So that was my first project at around the age of seven or maybe maybe even seven and a half, eight. And as you can imagine, completely boring for, for my age, but I persevered and did it. I think I knitted about 100 leaves. And looking back on it now, I realised that I actually learnt a lot because for each uh, leaf that you had to knit, um, you had to cast on, I think, 24 stitches and then knit a couple of rows of garter stitch. And then in the middle, you've got your decrease. So one side you'd have knit two together and the other one would be slip one, knit one, pass slip stitch over until you had only about three stitches on and then you'd bind them off. And then I had to sew them all up. So at a very early age I learned to sew and now I actually have no problems knitting in the flat and sewing seams so maybe it was good for me. So that was the major project that I remember, my first major project that I remember knitting. I possibly knitted a, a scarf before that but I can't remember. But this took a long time and it was actually quite fun picking colours that, that would fit in an autumn rug. So. I could even, we used a lot of scraps up and my grandmother would even say to me, oh look, here's a little bit of cream and you can put that on the tip of the, of the leaf and you can imagine that just a little bit of snow's fallen on the leaf. So, and then she'd, um, she was quite creative and she'd say, even this burnt pink, have you seen autumn leaves? Sometimes they're this colour. So I had all kinds of gorgeous colours in this rug. And I think now the rug is either in the attic or the basement of my sister-in-law's house somewhere in Australia. So it's very sad I can't show you this rug, but it is still around if it hasn't been eaten by moths. So moving on from that experience, um, the next thing that stands out in my mind was I think around the age of 14, I was going to a very conservative and religious school at the time. It was in the country and it only had about 15 students in it. And in my year, there was five girls. And we had, because it was very conservative and religious, we had a, a full-on home economics uh, class. And we were expected to learn quite and do quite ambitious projects. I can remember that we were even sewing a suit, a lined suit. So that was a skirt and a jacket. And um, I did my, I certainly did my skirt, did my lined skirt, and I cut out my jacket and I might have started to, sew it together but I didn't finish it I left the school by that time but as far as knitting went we our first project was um, we had to knit a cardigan or a jumper in stocking stitch just very plain and it couldn't be chunky wool it had to be um, Australians will know eight ply or just a basic DK weight so we couldn't cheat and just have super chunky wool and get through the project really quickly because the whole idea was we had to learn to knit with a really good tension and even stitches so that's why it was going to be stocking stitch so we could see really well was this good knitting or not. So I can't quite remember my project for that. I think it was um, a blue number but I'm talking now in the early half of the 80s. 
But then my second project we had to do for knitting, we had to do a cardigan or a jumper again, but we had to include some kind of pattern so we could have a cable down the front or maybe we could have a little lace section or whatever. And um, so this is really exciting. And so I went to my, with my mum to the only store in Albury. So I, I have to tell you that this, this religious school that I went to wasn't in Albury. It was actually in Bright, Bright, Victoria. If anyone knows Bright, it is really beautiful. It's a tiny little alpine village. Um, and this school was kind of on the outsides of, of this area. So I would stay there during the week and I'd come home to Albury on the weekend. So coming home on the weekend... Um, and I, I went with my mother to go and pick the wool. And here I have to just do a slight detour and tell you about this amazing shop in Aubrey. And it was called or known as the Haberdashery store. I love that word, Haberdashery. I'm living in Germany at the moment and no one ever has ever heard of that word, Haberdashery, but it's beautiful. So this store I have to tell you about because it's, it's like a time walk. It was a really big property and already from the beginning you could tell it was going to be interesting because before you even went into the, the store because there was a, a row of dummies in the, in the shop window front and they were, they looked like they were directly out of the 1940s because they were still wooden and they had beautiful painted, you know, beautiful curved lips, painted lips and eyebrows arching up and blue, blue makeup. And I couldn't believe this. I mean, I, I remember my first memories of this store when I was probably about six or seven, actually. But the dummies were wearing corsets, but not the sexy kind, the really old-fashioned kind that nobody wears anymore. But at that time, I suppose they were still selling them to, I don't know, matronly ladies who still wanted to, their, their curves to be pulled in so they looked a little bit like, boxes I'm not sure but these corsets were in the window they were hilarious to look at and on the other side you had gentlemen's wear and they were still and there was these um hats that my grandfather used to wear typically what you would see in old movies 1940s or 50s movies so they were there so you walked into the shop and immediately it had that wonderful smell of oldness so whatever combination that was. And it had aisles and aisles of, of materials, of wools, of buttons. And then it had all of your Pringle jumpers, you know, beautiful fine wool Pringle jumpers and scarves. And I don't know if anyone has ever heard of these, but my mother bought them for me and it was so shameful. But Bond's cotton underwear. So Bond's was a very good sturdy cotton underwear that was going to keep you warm in winter. So they literally went, they almost had little legs on them and they, and the tops of the underpants went up to your belly button. So incredibly non-sexy, totally overly practical. And they were always in a decent white. So they had packets and packets of these singlets and underpants. And, and what else? Oh, they even sold tartan kilts. So it was a crazy, crazy shop. Like, I don't know who was buying this stuff, but obviously enough people because it was open. And I think everyone went, went there to get their uniforms, school uniforms fitted. And I think you could buy your school shoes there as well. So apart from that, it was also had these lovely glass cabins of, um, lace and ribbons all curled up in beautiful designs. And I found this so fascinating because there were so many beautiful things to watch. And, um, and what fascinated, fascinated me the most is that there was the people who, the ladies who used to work here, uh, they were very knowledgeable. You could tell they could, my mum would often come in and ask them sewing questions or knitting questions and they would be able to answer anything. So I thought these ladies who were working here and they had ribbons and gorgeous material and lovely wools and buttons and clips and things that you can make into, oh, they could make themselves the most beautiful clothes. Why were they wearing such matronly boring clothes? And nearly all of them had these a-line skirts in black with like a very decent blouse with a little maybe Peter Pan collar and a cardigan. And of course, they'd have their spectacles 
on a cord around their neck and they would sort of put it on the ends and look at you very sternly as a young child to make sure that you hadn't get, had put your hands in the buttons. So I just could not believe that you would dress like that if you worked in such a beautiful store. Yeah, so, oh, and the other thing I had to tell you about this store, which I couldn't believe as well, is once you'd bought the things that you wanted and you were paying for it, the lady, um, the sales lady, would, uh, overhead, there was no teal. So up in the corner, I think at the back of the store, there was a box sort of hanging from the roof with glass around it and a man was sitting in there. And so she, and, and every time there was a sales transaction, this, this teal, I suppose it was like a, um, a metal tin came running or hurtling across the shop. You could hear it right on, on these, um, on these pull ropes all the way down to the counter and the lady would put your receipt and your money in and then she'd pull something in it, and this tin would go hurtling right to the end of the shop and then the man in the box would put your change in so obviously the ladies weren't trusted with the money I don't know but um and then the, the tin would come racing back down again and that was just amazing to watch and this went on this was going on in um certainly the late 70s and even the early 80s so it was an incredible store. So back to where I was, I was about 14 years old, my second knitting project for school, and we had to do something that was a little bit more adventurous than um, stocking stitch in our jumper or cardigan. So you have to remember that the 80s was this wonderful time of mohair. I think, I'm not sure when mohair came out, but it was certainly out in a big way in the early 80s. And I loved it. So looking through the patterns, I found this amazing design that had the typical 80s uh, bat wings and it was kind of all nipped in at the waist, so it was very romantic. And it was com and nipped in here at the cuffs and, as I said, bat, bat wings. And all over it, it was covered in lace, like an incredibly lacy, open design. So it was something that you would wear over the top of something. So I found this pattern, I thought, absolutely, I want to knit this, I want to wear this, more importantly. And um, then I found a fantastic wool, which mm, was a red, it was a, like a rusty red, a little bit more orangey than this wool here, and it was some blend of mohair, but completely mohair. And I thought, oh, this is just going to look gorgeous. And so my mother came along and she said, Absolutely not. You can't do that. So my mother was a good knitter, but she was a very, a very solid knitter. She, she had fantastic tension. She did beautiful endings and finishings on all her knitting, but she wasn't adventurous. She, she might have, you know, neat little feature cables or lace work or shaping and things. That was no problem for her, but, um, or even a, a really basic ferrile. But anything else, absolutely not. And this was a really full-on lace pattern that might have had something like 25 rows in the pattern. And she said, if you make a mistake, I can't help you with it. So we're not getting this. And I so wanted to wear it, so I begged and probably had a, I don't know, threatened, tantrumed, whatever. And finally she agreed. So I was so excited, bought the wool and the pattern, went home. And I can still remember this amazing feeling of free falling is what I call it. It's like bungee jumping or something. When you've got, you're starting a new pattern, it's really difficult. It's like 25 rows of pattern and you can't tell if you're doing it right or wrong and you're not going to be able to tell if you've done it right or wrong until you've done quite a lot of it and then you can start recognizing the pattern underneath. And so as you knit your row, you're looking behind you thinking, yeah, I should be right. This should be happening right now. And so you've got some kind of, like, you've got a platform underneath of safety. But for the first 25 rows, you're like free falling. And I was so determined to get the, to do this, you know, without my mother's help, obviously. So I can remember sitting there and counting. Yes, I've, I've counted my five there's, I've knitted my five stitches and now I've knit two together and I've slipped one and I've knit through the back loop, so that's all right. And just double checking each row so many times I think, right, I have to be right, I'll move on, turn around, do the next row. And then just this amazing feeling when it got faster and faster and you think, hey, 
I can see this. It's not just this amazing mess of holes and things and string everywhere. I can actually see this pattern developing and you get the confidence. So that was really great. I, I can still remember it. And what I learned through that was that I'm actually a project knitter. I'm not a process knitter. I'm a project knitter. So I don't knit just for the process of knitting. Although I'd have to say if I was in a room and somebody was knitting, I would think my fingers would get itchy if I wasn't knitting. And I'd think, hmm, let me do a couple of rows of your knitting. Okay, so in that way I'm a process knitter. But most of the time, and I'll tell you another little secret because it's extremely rare and I don't know if it's weird or not, but um, I don't have a stash. Most people have stashes, but I don't. And you know why? This is because when I go to a wool store, and I do love wool stores, even incredibly bad wool stores, and I have to say in North Wales, um, there are a few, when you walk in and you go to the wool section and there's a couple of uh, acrylic numbers in bright iridescent colours, and that's about it. It's very disappointing. But I am looking on the internet and I'm going to check some more out. But um, now I've lost my train of thought. Yes, okay, going into a wool store. I do go into many wool stores. I can't pass by without going into one. But I And I have a quick look around at the walls and have a feel when I think I'm allowed to. And then I go head straight to the pattern section. And I look through and say, what have they got? What pattern books have they got? What can I, what can I knit? And I look through this. This is what I would do actually before I went on Ravelry which was not too long ago, maybe only two years ago. But before I even got onto Ravel Ravelry or on the internet, I would just go to a wool store, find their pattern sections, flick through until I found a garment that I thought, oh, that is so beautiful. I certainly want to wear that. I'm going to knit it. And then I would find a good wool that would match that pattern and I would knit it up. So that was my motivation, which I think after being on Ravelry and um, reading different blogs and, and seeing some podcasts, that seems to be pretty rare. Most people get the wool first and then they think about what are they going to do with it. So I discovered that at age 14 with my lace knitting and I think I got full marks for it. So I was very proud of myself. So moving on from my wonderful lace mohair number, um, oh, and I have to tell you, that um, that had two lives. It started off because I was, at the time, going to this conservative and religious um, school, being worn always over just a neat blouse, maybe a cream blouse with a nice, decent skirt. But then I left home, and years later I found it again, and I pulled it out, and I thought, oh, this great, very lacy number is going to look fantastic over a sexy black bra so it got a new lease of life and I wore it as a very sexy number for a while to the envy of quite a few of my friends so um, yeah so after the age of about 16 I didn't knit for quite a few years I went to university had lots of fun did a lot of music and practicing actually had no time to knit and very rarely thought of knitting and then going to about 28 no, 26, I think, is when I first met my husband. And we'd been going out together for a while, and I thought, okay, it's time for a boyfriend jumper. So I took him to the Ballarat Woolen Mills, and I thought, okay, I'm going to knit him, and it had been years since I'd knitted, so I'd kind of forgotten things. But I think knitting is like riding a bike. If you've done it to a certain level, you're always going to remember, even if you have like 10 or 15 years break. So... um yeah, so we I took him into this woolen mills and I picked out some wool for him and I and it was quite chunky and I thought it's a really nice bright blue so it's going to do well on his complexion and I'll knit him a jumper. Well, it was really quite a failure. It was, if you can imagine Cookie Monster, it was, it was kind of that colour blue and it was that chunky that it could have actually looked like Cookie Monster's skin or fur and... Unfortunately, I think the problem was that I did the, the um, I should have done the neck on a smaller size needle. So it was rather big, 
the, ne the neck was big and so it would sw stretch down on the shoulders and that made the arms extra long so they would be kind of stretched down to here. So Andrew would put this jumper on and it was a bit kind of stretchy here and long here and cookie monster looking. And he really for a long time did not want me to knit him anything else because he didn't want First of all, for me, because I had I always bought expensive wool, had to be good quality wool. So he didn't want me to spend the money and put all the time into something that he was obliged to wear that he wasn't going to enjoy. So unfortunately, that was the end of that product um, project. And then my daughter, we got married, despite the boyfriend jump, jumper. And then I had a little baby, Madeline, and um, so I started knitting for her and got my technique back again, and things started to fit. So. Before that, you might notice that I am wearing an Alice Starmore Henry VIII. Now, this is one of her most famous designs. It's most um, recognised. If you were to say Alice Starmore, you'd probably think of this one or the St. Bridget's or um, no, Kraga. So this is one of them. If you look on Ravelry, this one is probably one of the most popular designs. And it's a, a stunning feral pattern. And the background colour changes and also the, the foreground pattern changes all the time. So I have to tell you very quickly how I came across Alice Darmore and then um, I'll move on. But I was in New York taking singing lessons from uh, a really well-known singing teacher who's now dead, Cornelius Reed. And so in between my, and I had a lesson every day for a month. And so when I wasn't practicing or taking a singing lesson from this guy, I would head around and, and do touristy things. And I came across a fantastic wool shop, and I can't remember what it is, what it was called, um, in New York. And it was a tiny little shop. And I went, of course, as I usually do, to their pattern section, and I pulled out this book, and I'd never heard of Alice Darmore before, and it was one of her earlier, The Tutors, and I saw these designs in it, which were so beautiful. I had never seen anything like this, just immaculate designing, gorgeous shapes. Every one of them just looked like me, like things that I would wear and want to knit. So, of course, I bought the, the book and drooled all over it. And I could, at that stage, I had no technique to knit um, fair isle or anything, or I could do cables, but not really, really hard cables. So I just uh, tried the Elizabeth the First for anyone who knows that design, and I found that one quite challenging at the time. But I since then, and this gets back to me being a project knitter, if I find beautiful designs and I definitely want to knit them and I want to wear them, I find out how to do the technique. So I taught myself to fair isle. And I'm wearing this beautiful jumper. And since then, I have ventured to, work, to knit my husband some more jumpers. I've knitted him an Alice Darmore St. Bridget's. And I spent hours making it absolutely perfectly so it fits him and doing modifications. So since I've spoken to, spoken to you about him, it is now time to introduce you to him. So... If you don't mind, please put down your knitting for a brief second and put your hands together and give a little warm welcome to my husband who is slightly shy. So, thank you very much, Andrea. <laughs> um, yeah, my name is Andrew. I am Andrea's husband. We try to keep things simple with Andrew and Andrea. Um, I don't think either of us are very good with names, so that helps. Um, yeah. And knitting, knitting for me, my knitting history, I've actually got a very long knitting history. Um, when we met, Andrea's already mentioned that we had a child, um, I think it was about 16 years ago when Andrea was knitting for our daughter Madeline, knitting small things. She was, as she still is, very keen to get me into the knitting and so she introduced me to that, showed me how to do it, gave me a, a pair of needles and some, I think it was fairly junky wool. And junky or chunky? Well, it was probably it was probably both. It was no, probably junky I never, and I chunky. never have you junky. You didn't have any junky wool. All right, it was just chunky wool. Anyway, I was given some wool and some needles and some instructions. I think it was about this wide. I think it was going to be a very small sort it of. It started scarf. off that wide. It started off that wide. Yeah. So I, I 
struggled away. I think we were doing what a stocking stitch. Yeah. So, and I think I did the the sort of standard beginner knitting um, where some stitches disappeared and uh, some stitches were were added along the way. And I think the, the scarf grew a little bit. I think it was very tense as I was I'm certain <laughs> at the time. And uh, I think we gave up on that fairly quickly. I never gave up. I think you gave up. <clears throat> oh, I, I certainly gave up. <laughs> yeah. And in, 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 so in my long knitting history, there is then a long gap. Uh, and <laughs> our daughter is now 17 years old. And um, Andrea has managed to get me back onto the knitting. Yes. So um, with that, we can actually move on to our next episode. When I was at school, there was a... a or maybe a primary school or kindergarten, there was um, show and tell when the kids could, you know, all the kids could bring their newest toy or something they'd done at home. Uh, my mum, who was a, a primary school teacher, always called that bring and brag because it was really what have I scored and, and where have I been lucky. So um, we're going to move on to our next segment, which is bring and brag. So, Andrea, would you like to start? I reckon you should. I should start. Okay. <laughs> So we've heard about my scarf attempt. The scarf, I think it ended up about that big. Um, I have to say, my second project. Yes. Which well, I it's completed. actually your first. Well, it's, it's my first, first completed. Finished. It's my first completed project, yes. And here it is. Um, and it is the... I don't know what it is. <laughs> I don't know the pattern name. It's I a found free pattern, isn't it? It's a free pattern on Ravelry. We'll, gonna, we'll put it in the program notes. When I've found it's it. Called, isn't it called temperate? I know. It's one where you have to do, um, it's meant to show you how to do jogging or something, but I cut all of that out and decided that he should just um, stocking stitch it in the round. And you want to tell them what I first of all did with that hat? I got you. Yeah, but we have to get this this right. Because what did we do? Because I'm confused. Okay. We started, because this is something that I've learned. I've watched Andrea knit over the years, and I think there's two significant things that have changed. I don't know. What big steps. Well, one, one big step as far as becoming a knitter who can knit amazing things um, is that sometimes you just have to go back. You have to take so things out. Taking yeah. things out. So I've actually knitted this na- hat. Tinker. You have to undo your knitting. Yeah, tinker or, or just pull things Unravel. completely to pieces. <laughs> How many times have I knitted this hat, Andrea? <laughs> well, you haven't knitted it completely, I've, only completely once. Yeah, and incompletely it was... twice. Yeah. Up to, up to the decreases, twice. Right up yeah. to here. Okay. And, and how did we start doing We started thing? off doing oh. it. I think I was, I was doing a lot of work myself on knitting yeah. and... This is really shameful, but um, the way this pattern was written out, it was written out so long-winded. It had so many pages of the pattern. I thought, oh, I can't be bothered reading through all of this. <laughs> so, so I just said, cast on this, these stitches and start walking, working back and forth because yeah. you need to practice your, uh, pearl. your pearl. So I thought, Which we'll just do a seam up the loves. back. Yeah, so he, yeah. he cast on the right a number of... Uh, amount of, of stitches and then he um, started knitting back and forth so to try to get his pearl gauge the same as his knit gauge and um, and then at some stage I realized that that wasn't actually what the pattern said <laughs> this is so shameful I should be supporting him yeah. in every possible way so I said we're going to have to undo all your knitting and start again <laughs> yeah. but you took that in good spirit actually oh, I you? did absolutely very good yeah. spirit yeah, so then, so we undid it all. Me. So, yes. And then we did it on DPS. And, and then, no, we didn't do that. Yes, we did. No, we didn't. Oh, we did it on Magic Loop. Yes. We did it. So he learned to do Magic Loop at the same time. So he gave up purling, which was not as good as his knitting, and he took on Magic Looping. Yeah. Yeah, so. So I mastered Magic Loop. And. I have to say, I reckon that's a pretty good result. Well, put it on. Let's we'll let them on. decide. Well, they can decide. It's. Oh, that was the other thing you told me with this hat was that it needs to be a bit longer. Make it a bit longer. <laughs> yeah, it could yeah. Did possibly. we need to do it a bit longer? Yeah, yeah. It covers your ears. Yeah. 
<laughs> I think I'm going to tend to wear it a bit I like was that. really shamefully not giving enough much attention to, to, to helping poor not Andrew. <laughs> but I'm pretty impressed. I have to say I'm pretty impressed. He um, did a very good job of it. And it's yeah, very neat. A bit of a... You should try to show the, um, the decrease. Yeah, so we've got a bit of a two-direction decrease happening up Can here. Can you remember what you it's, did? Yeah, well, we do things like knit two together and... <laughs> That's on one slip, side. Slip and knit. And knit. So S S K. So yeah. slip, slip, and then knit through the back loops together, so that the both decreases are going to be leaning towards each other like this. Have a look at that. Which and I must say, well. this is. I mean, as far as me and knitting, um, I've always found that what you can do with knitting is incredible. Not having done anything myself, but this all comes together, and it all comes together in this little cross here and then you do a little circle and tie it all up and it works and I, I find it amazing even something as simple as that and uh, I'm impressed yeah it's so good. that's my that's my very first project so do you want to say what the wool is um, the wool is the wool is it's it's left over from um, a jumper that I knitted my daughter and it's um Alistair Moore yeah. Hebridean uh, three ply and the color I think is sea enema and yeah but I will put all of this will be in the I project think it might notes. be sea enema <laughs> <laughs> I do get my whacking words fuddled <laughs> okay so see what an enemy an enemy okay yeah. So that's the colour, and I have just enough left over for a hat. And poor Andrew, he wrapped it up and thought you'd give it to Madeline, our daughter. I was going to say that. What you were say that. <laughs> don't, we, we don't, leave that. Don't we tell our daughter. Story. Okay. Yep. So that's slightly too private. We won't say that on the first episode. That's my that's my bring and brag. Yeah, that's your bring and brag. What have okay. you got to show us, Andrea? <sighs> So I finished this maybe a week ago and this is my, this is a design by Kate Davies and it's Catkin. So but her design goes quite down low over the hips and I just wanted a short one. So it's got a little bit of, of waist shaping in as you can see. I don't know, I've worn it a few times so it's probably a little stretched out. But was the waist got, shaping in the design? Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. And I've knitted it, and it's got, I don't know if you can see it, maybe it's too far away, but it has these love, a lovely section down the front. You've got twisted stitch, so you've got a one-on-one -on -one twisted rib around the, the hem and around the cuffs and also around the collar here. And then you've got the, the twisted rib panel going right from the bottom all the way up here and into the collar and I think that I think that's a lovely simple it's very simple but really elegant and then she's got a cable up the front here so there's a lot of stocking stitch in this so the back is just simply plain stocking stitch and so are the arms so it's a lot of reasonably boring knitting in it but if I liked it simply because I'm a product knitter and I wanted to wear this design so I thought I'll put up with a stocking stitch because this is incredibly elegant here. And the wool I've used is um, a Rowan fine tweed in this gorgeous, I think it's totally gorgeous, mustard colour. And you may not see, maybe I need to bring it really close. I'll hold it in front of you, you look quite light. But there's flecks of colour in the wool so you've got little bits of orange and green and cream so it's a real lovely tweed effect in this fantastic mustard color which I love to wear a lot so that's my catkin by Kate Davies and that's what I finished about a week ago so the next thing we want to look at today is what you're working on and what is under construction Andrea <laughs> Okay, I've been working on some pretty simple designs, but really lovely designs from Kim Hargrave's book, Still. So, the first one I'm going to show you is a coat. It's like a blanket coat that my daughter picked out. 
And she, when she saw it, she thought, oh, I totally love that, Mum, can you knit that for me? So that's one picture of it. It has a hood, and it's just like wrapping a beautiful blanket around you. But it's a lot of knitting. There's another picture of it. I don't know if you can see that clearly. But it's a really great design. What I love about Kim Hargraves is um, most of her designs are for the inexperienced knitter. But despite that, you get these great pictures, or I'm saying pictures because I'm looking at them, but just really beautiful designs that look like um, garments that you could just go and buy in a top-end boutique. So she just they're all very classic, modern-looking. That's just totally gorgeous. It's a slouchy hat. I don't know if the camera's going to be able to pick this up. So she's actually, and this is a, a thick um, cabled cardigan, she's actually one of my favourite designers because I love almost everything she designs. I think I would really like to wear that. And she she just puts in little pieces of detail like this lovely um, cable panel down the front just to make it extra elegant. So, and I'm knitting that. This is the... This is the right panel, so you can see. Can you hold that for me here? Yeah. Hold that up there. You can see that there's the, the start of the um, underarm shaping. And this is done in the Rowan brushed fleece, and that is such a gorgeous wool. It's um, a combination of fine merino and baby alpaca. Actually, I should read it to you and tell you exactly what it is. The whole thing is knitted in a stocking stitch, but reasonably tight. So it's really like a blanket fabric. So um, I've got the ball here. Hold, you hold it up with two hands. It says no, the, the gauge for this on, on the label, they say they recommend that you do 13 stitches for 10 centimetres or four inches. But the pattern actually tells you to do it 14 stitches, which means to knit tighter. And I like that because then it's really like a, um, a thick blanket feeling. Yeah, so I, I'm, and the color is gorgeous. I think this color is Nook, but the shade number is 00260. And yeah, so it's 65% wool and 30% alpaca and 5% um, acrylic, so polyamid. And it's extra fine merino wool and baby alpaca because normally alpaca, I would feel it as being a little bit scratchy on my skin, but this is not scratchy at all. It's just really beautiful and soft and cuddly. And it's gonna be a beautiful hooded, you can imagine it when it goes over your head and around. It's gonna be just a gorgeous hooded coated Hooded coated, <laughs> hooded blanket coat. Okay, so, and, and the wool comes in these gorgeous big squishy <laughs> That's bundles. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Yeah, so it takes about, um, about 11 or 12 of these to make this. The coat is going to come down, oh, I think maybe this part, this far underneath your bum. So it covers up the bum area, so you're nice and snug there, and you can wrap it right around. So my daughter's really, actually she's been doing some of this knitting. When I taught her to knit, and she doesn't knit very often because shes I don't think she's a knitter at heart. It's rather sad. But she does it under duress, and also because she really wants this. And I've got other things I want to knit as well, and so... I teach her to knit basically at my gauge, which is very handy, because then she takes on. And so she's knitted most of this, but I've started it and, and other panels. So that's under construction from me and Madeline. And so, do you want to show what you've got? Alrighty, yep, <clears throat> from me. So we saw my first hat, and uh, <clears throat> this is going to be my second hat. And this one we are knitting in the flat. Is it right to knit it in the flat? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. We want to continue. Yes. We don't want to stop No. <laughs> we did actually consider doing this no, in the round. No, we're doing we? this in the flat. Why are we doing in the Well, the pattern we're tells you it, to. Yeah. 
But okay, so this is a this is a free. Not to do it? No, I can say why you decided not to do okay. it. This is a free pattern from uh, Rowan. Yeah. And it's called Calder Beanie. Yeah. And it's purple wool. <laughs> yeah. So the pattern you can get <laughs> online if you go yep. to their website. Um, they've got a section of patterns and you can click on free patterns or, or if you become a member, I think you just have to sign up and be a member. You don't pay anything. And then you get access to free patterns, like a new free pattern almost every month. I think it is. Yeah. And I think it's one of those. Yeah. So the pattern does say to do it in the flat. I've still got these. What do we call these needles? Circular needles. Circular needles, needles right. Circular needles, but just using them as though they're two separate needles. Mm. Um, it's a little bit more convenient. Um, it has got a slight, we haven't got the design there, but it's got a slight cable pattern in it. So it's actually about 10 rows of normal um, ribbing. We can see there. And then there's, is that the good side or the bad side? Yeah, if That's, I pull this through, the then side. you can just let it drop. Yeah. So here's the good side, and we can just see the first row where we've got the little bit of cabling happening here. Um, just hold it like that and then yeah. leave it. So it's pretty easy. Um, start off on a slightly smaller needle to get a bit of a band happening and then move to a slightly bigger needle for the rest of the hat. I don't know what happens as far as um, decreasing to get the shape into it, but we'll get there. Um, and yeah, a very basic cable because I was really keen to try a cable thing. Um, and I can tell you, did you want to say something? Yeah, I can't think why we didn't put this into... There, in there the was round. a reason why I didn't change it to be knitted in the round, the round, but I can't think about why it was. Yeah, it was just a little bit. We, we did think of doing it in the round, and I think you could, all right, because um, the way it is now, we're going to have to seam it up the back. And you can see, if you look at the pattern, there's um, two lots of pearls that it starts in. It starts and finishes with two lots of pearls, and two of those stitches... Are actually going to be knitted up in the seam. Mm. So it's simple enough to get that out of the pattern. If you do it in the round, then you just take off the two rows that are going to be in the seam. But then once you get into the decreasing, it gets a little bit more complicated, and we didn't want to think about that right now. Yeah. I think also I thought it was a good idea for you to learn to seam. Right. <laughs> yes, whereas my position was I'll do anything to avoid doing a seam because Andrea speaks about it as one of those things that's worth Easy. avoiding. No, I don't. Well, I've, no, you say you're good at it and it sounds like it's exceptional that you're good at it. No, 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 no. No, I'm not. Anyway, just, from my side, I want you to start It just off. sounds like one of those finishing things that I don't want to have to do. I like it when it's I fun. do all the knitting and then it's all finished. So, anyway... But sometimes, we'll simply by knitting in the flat, you don't take your, your project will be just as quick if you include the, the seaming up as if you try to do another technique. But to, to avoid the seaming, you can be spending more time doing that technique. Yeah. So it's not always an advantage. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so that's the hat. It is a purple wool. I picked the color. I like the color. And I picked it for me because it's a colour that's good for me. Our daughter thinks it's too but, feminine and that she should have the hat. Yes, yeah, so Madeline is after the hat. And that's the, the <laughs> other part of the story. I've taken away the other hat that I made. Um, the story with the first hat that I created is that I gave it to her as a present and she says it doesn't suit her. So she's not going to wear it. So she's rejected. So she has rejected my first creation. <laughs> but I can her handle Her father's that. first knitting project. I can handle that. And I'm going to wear it myself because we live in Frankfurt and it's good to have a beanie. So, yeah, this is the second beanie. I think it's going to be really cool and um, we're going it's to going fight to be beautiful. over it. The, the last one took me two weeks. Two weeks? Yeah. Really? It took me two weeks to do the final version. <laughs> okay, it took After a lot longer. It took a lot longer to do the first version. That's right. And, um, yeah, you, there was some fairly slow. You gave yourself a, when, well, when you started to do it. Yeah, but I, I started off, I, I agreed to do knitting every day for Andrea, and she was a bit disappointed when that was just one row. He said he, yeah, evening. he said he was going to do a 30-day challenge. I did a 30-day challenge. <laughs> that meant like he had to knit. Every day. Every day for 30 days, and I was so happy about that. I thought, that's fantastic. By the end of 30 days, he's going to have great tension. Andrea was imagining socks for he's, himself. He's going to know quite a lot. I didn't think he would knit one row or two rows, <laughs> and that's my day of knitting done. Yeah. 
So that was a little hard to, I had a bit of a struggle with that. Yeah. But you've got to tell and them a bit all more of the about work, this. All of the work from that 30 days was undone. And, and by the way, the designer of this lovely hat, which you're not going to see until maybe the next episode when a lot more is done on it, I'll just show you again, is Sarah Hatton, which Andrew keeps joking yeah. as Sarah Hat, hat on. on. Hat on. Hat on. <laughs> so that's, that's his. Good. And do you want to read out the, the wool? I can read out the wool. <clears throat> All right. So I think it's a fairly standard Rowan yarn. It's called Pure Wool Superwash DK. And uh, you can wash it in the washing machine on 40 degrees. And true to its name, it is 100% wool. And I was interested to see it's made in Romania. So uh -huh. there we go. Okay. And it's, it's actually quite a heathery. It's not just a flat color. It's a heathery purple. Okay. So it's got little specks in it. I think it's very, very pretty. It's nice and soft. Yeah. Is that number there for the color? That's the colour, that's the shade, and that's the ah, lot. Ah, shades. So I'll read out the number. I'll read out the number. So it's shade 106, right? There's an SH here for the yeah. shade. I didn't know that. And your lot, no because name. each lot is um, dyed separately, so yeah. it can have slight differences. And yours is the 4125. Yeah. So everyone knows I've now got lot 4125. If you want to make exactly the same coloured hat as me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, so my next under construction oh. is also from this book still. And the next one I'm knitting is this design. And what I love about this is it's a basic. And normally I would think, okay, I'm going to go, because it's quite cold in Frankfurt in Germany, and I wear jumpers all the time, but I actually wear many layers. And I have gone out and bought cashmere, you know, fine tops like this to wear underneath my other knitted cardigans or jumpers or vests or whatever. And I thought, well, you know what, I can make myself that. I don't actually, I should make it so that I don't ever buy myself a jumper of any kind. I knit them. That's what I said to myself. And then I saw this design. I thought, this is so elegant. It's a lot of stocking stitching, which is quite boring but because I prefer to do colour work or something a bit more interesting, but I love the result. And at the bottom, you may not see here, but there's, um, you cast on, I think, uh, if you were going, okay, I'm really hopeless at maths. If you were going to cast on a set amount of stitches, <laughs> and just getting worried yeah. in case I put him on a test, yeah. and then you half them, and then you half them again, and that's what you knit with. Do you say that is triple the amount of stitches or four times the amount of stitches or it's four times it's four times half and half i oh, go okay. half and half there we go so i didn't have very good schooling obviously so you cast on this is the hardest bit of this pattern but you cast on four times the amount of stitches and you work it in the flat so you work the front section and the back section separately you, you cast on um four times the amount of stitches that you need and in the first row you decrease to half the amount and then the second row you decrease again to half the amount and it creates this puckered frill down here which I think is so elegant. So you do that on the on the front and the back and the sleeves. Maybe you can't see this. I can't see it. You can't see it. Never no. mind. So um So where did this happen? What do you mean, where did what happen? Where did this half and half happen? Is here, here, here. So I'll show you. That's what it looks like. Of course it has to be blocked, so it's it's going to sit better eventually. But can you see that? You've got this little, and I'm using dark wool, but you've got this um, pucket uh, frilly edge on the bottom. So it's like a nice, simple, straight, basic um, fine jumper that you can wear underneath a cardigan but it's got an elegant edge to it this frill on the base and on the sleeve here's a sleeve so I've done the back and the sleeve that's the end of the sleeve this is the whole sleeve you hold this bit yeah and I'll hold up here and here because it's in stocking stitch it's um rolling on the sides of course but you can't even see it's knitted just so no one's going to know I knitted this. I'll have to tell them, otherwise they won't give me a compliment. And we know as knitters, we do love to get compliments on our knitting, don't we? So I've done one sleeve and the back. 
which again you can you can hold this up I have to so is there yeah you hold that there for that. that this is the sleeve and then what's going to happen another little detail that Kim Hargraves has done and I haven't done it yet but the top it looks like I have but the top is going to have a slightly rolled collar on it and so you pick up stitches around and then you knit um, with the wrong side here so the pearl side on the right side fabric and then it's going to curl around a little bit and just have this little rolled collar and I think it's super elegant now she uses a different wall to what I'm using well, she recommends that you use it. Oh, this design is called Temperate, the one I've been showing you. And she describes it as a fitted sweater with frill edges, edgings. And she uses two, two yarns together, the Rowan Mohair Haze and the Rowan Fine Lace. And I'm on a little bit of a budget, so I wanted to do a substitute yarn. And I picked another Rowan yarn. And I totally love this yarn and I would just, I had originally thought I'm going, you know what, I'm going to do this basic um, jumper in about three or four different colours so I can wear it with everything. There's a lot of stocking stitch in there and I don't know if I can do three or four of them. <laughs> but so I use instead this, uh, the Alpaca Merino DK. And this is a really gorgeous yarn. And again, because it's made out of baby alpaca, I can wear it on my skin. But it's so soft, have a feel. Is that that funny knitted one? Yeah. It's sort of, it's really weird. It's like, it's plaited. Yeah. The individual. Maybe um, if I do this, you can zoom in on this later. Yeah. But yeah, it's like a chain. But it's incredibly soft. It's 83% baby alpaca, 7% wool, and 10% nylon. It's really beautiful and squishy. Oh, excuse me, squishy and soft. And this colour is a gorgeous colour. It's, um, I suppose you could call it maroon. Yeah. Maroon or, um, yeah, it's a little bit purpley. And what was I going to tell you about it? Okay, so the shade number doesn't have a name, it's just double O and then triple one. So O O one one one. Yeah. So I'm actually knitting things. Well, this is because this is something that I need. And the other one for my daughter because she wants it. So I think that's the end of under construction. Yes. <laughs> been looking out the window because we have to take our poor dog out for a walk but it's been raining the whole day and the rain is actually going horizontal with the wind it looks very romantic very um wuthering heights out here yeah but it is quite good to be inside looking out at it we can actually i, mean, I think andrea mentioned we put the cemetery right out the back here i think you can actually see a couple of gravestones there they're all slate because um this is a very big slate mining area so there's slate everywhere so if you die here you get a slate gravestone um and if we look across that direction i know you can't see this but there are sheep out in the fields in the rain looking quite content although um, they must have at least half of their legs in water i reckon yeah and there's a very beautiful river there that looks like it's about to burst its banks so we might end up being flooded in a day or two yeah it's Happy. actually really beautiful through here. It's a shame you can't see it. It looks well, paintable. We might we might try to get out and get a bit of uh, a few shots outside. They were talking about floods um, around this time, and I, when I was out taking the dog for a walk last night, I did notice that we kind of at the bottom of the hill on either side. So it's going to be interesting. <laughs> our house. Yeah, our house. Our okay. front door yeah. is pretty much down the bottom. Of yeah. the hills, of the valley. So, yeah. so Andrea, yes. what's our next segment? Our next segment is from the archives. And in this segment, you are allowed to bring things that you've knitted in the not-so-recent past. So that just means it's a segment of me, because <laughs> you don't yeah. have anything. No, I have a <laughs> gap in my history. Yes. Okay. So what are you going to show us? 
the first thing I'm going to show is you. Oh. So, why don't you sit a little bit forward? And Andrew is knitting a really beautiful jumper, which he's proud to wear. Am I knitting this jumper? No, 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 no. 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 Andrew is wearing. Did I say knit? Yes. Oh. Andrew is wearing a very beautiful jumper that I knitted him, and he's very proud to knit, to wear this, unlike his Cookie Monster <laughs> <laughs> yep. jumper, which I think ended up in the salvo bin. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Even though it had good uh, good, um, I've got to make sure it's not stretching on the around the collar. So this is a beautiful design by Alice Darmore. It's one of her most famous ones, Saint Bridget, and I love it. I think, oh, I just totally love it. It's got this, I hope you can see this, but it has a gorgeous Celtic um, cable down the down here and then you've got plaits on either side and then a smaller Celtic cable here. It's just to die for this yep. design. I love also it. on the sleeves. Yeah, hang on, stay still first Sorry, stay and still. I'll show, show the front panel. Okay, so you've got a small Celtic cable panel longing along here and then a nice plait and this wider Celtic cable, a plait. And then you've got some filler stitch in here and then the back is exactly the same. In the design, it actually has um, a bit of a, a collar coming up. You've got this lovely plait going around the collar as the collar and then it has a little bit extra coming up, almost like a frill. And I thought that was a little bit too feminine for Andrew. For a bloke. For a bloke. So I left that one out and I did modifications on this too. But before I start, I want to tell you about the wool. This is um, Alice Darmore's own wool, the Hebridean two, three ply. This is a three ply in Selkie. I love this wool. It is like an Australian black opal. It's dark, but it has got all of these shimmering colours you can see when you look closely when you've got the sun on it. You can see green and red and purple and blue and gold. And it's actually named after, or Selkie is like the Gaelic name for a seal. And it just also reminds me of a seal skin. So when you, the seals are in the sea and they come up on the beach and their skins are still glistening wet and the sun shines on their backs. And it just looks like this. This is probably one of my favorite wools out of her collection. It is so unique. It's gorgeous. I don't know if this is going to pick it up or not, but if it doesn't, go to her website. It's Virtual Yarns, and she is an amazing woman. I'm actually going to do a little bit more on her in one of my other episodes on, on the podcast because I think there's so much to talk about her. She's quite eccentric, but she's really, she's there's a lot there. And she does fantastic story and, and picture builds for each of the yarn colours that she makes. And so you can just spend a couple of hours of beautiful reading and watching. Her daughter, Jade, is a photographer and does gorgeous designs. And all of her walls are based on flora and fauna in the Hebridean Islands, where she lives. Tell us about the modifications you did. The modifications I did. Okay, well, my man has broad shoulders. Oh, yeah. Show your broad shoulders. <laughs> broad shoulders, yeah. <laughs> and a thin waist. So, careful. <laughs> I didn't want, and he's got rather narrow hips, so I didn't want it to be kind of, it is made like a tunic, and I didn't want it to be kind of loose and baggy around his bum, so I actually knitted it in that shape, like this. So I, I think I started off in a small, or even smaller than a small. He doesn't like me saying that, it's not very manly. This always comes up. <laughs> and then I increased here, on the side panels and <clears throat> this might be either a small or a medium up here I'm not sure I I will actually put this in the project notes but it's also on my Ravelry page if you go to Fruity Knitting and um, St Bridget's I've, I've got my modifications there but it is a oh I did a modified drop shoulder too so I wanted to take some of the bulk out from here so I just did a modified drop shoulder on it and of course, I didn't give him the frill, just the um, just the plait. And it took me a while because I didn't want this to be sticking out and gaping. And some people's St. Bridget's was tending to do that. I thought, what am I going to do? Because I wanted it to lie flat like this. And in the end, I actually sewed this plait around, and then I put a wet cloth on top, 
and I steamed it in place so that the in because I wanted the inside row to be smaller, the inside circumference to be smaller than the outside circumference. So that's but I couldn't figure out how to do that and still keep this flat. So I um I just steamed it and it's been perfect and it, I think it it fits you really yeah. really well. Yeah. So I'm really proud of that. Yeah. Well, I love it. This is my favorite jumper. It is, because you love cables. I love the cables. I love this particular cable. So this pattern here I think is so cool. And this one too, which is also, as I said, on the sleeves. Oh, yeah, we didn't um, show the sleeves. <laughs> so yeah. hold it there. It's just such a it's not a it's not a really regimented triangly. It's I mean not cables mirrored. are cool. It's but this... it's not it's not so symmetrical and it's yeah. a bit more irregular. So, exactly. Yeah. That, that's what makes it special, I think, is that it is, I mean, here, that is mirrored. That is a mirror from that. Yeah. But the, the cable in itself isn't. Yep. And it fits beautifully. It comes down on the sleeves just right, I think. And it sits, yeah. sits really well. Yeah. So This one was definitely a success. And I love the colour too. I wasn't sure at first. You we wanted at the a couple green of, one. Yeah, yeah, we looked at a couple of different colours at first, and I was concerned about this being dull, but I don't think it is. I think it's really nice. People do say that cables are better on light colours, mm. but I actually think this is just fine because it's quite a – it is a reasonably chunky cable. I think it makes it look mm. manly, <laughs> so it's good enough for a bloke. But – it's the cables are thick and big enough that you can see them, and it's actually it's it's quite a lot of cables. So it also doesn't. If if I did it in too bright a colour, for instance, it might just be too too much too much too too overwhelming. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> for shy Andrew. Yeah. Yeah. As it is, people come up in the street and they give you a cuddle. Yeah, they want to hug him because he's so cuddly. Yeah, see. So it's a like danger. That. It's a danger a knitter has. Yeah. Oh, we've... So, we've got a visitor here. Come on, you can introduce yourself. Hop up here. Come on, up here, Jack. Ah, there's a boy. He Good boy. Sit He's not too empty. Sit, sit down, sit down. Let him sit here for a minute and you can say hello. All right. And then he goes, oh, Jackie boy. He's, he's taking that. <laughs> this is Jack, our poodle. He's three years old and he's a naughty boy and Andrew, Andrew spoils him. <laughs> But he, he desperately wants to go out and have a run outside, so we'll, we'll do that pretty soon. So, say hello to the camera, Jack. He, wants, he prefers yeah. to gnaw on Andrew's hand. Hey, little boy, you're a cutie yeah, boy. Give mum a kiss, too. Aren't you? Hey, look up here. Yeah. <laughs> you're a naughty boy, but you're very cute. He, in case you didn't know, poodles have wool. They don't have hair. So, And every now and again when I shave him, provided I've washed the wool beforehand, it looks really spinnable. I'm not a spinner, but I could imagine spinning it and um, putting it in to something. But he's very cute, aren't you, Jackie boy? Hey, aren't you? You're a good boy. Yep. You're a good he's, boy. He's actually got a piece of clothing too, hasn't he? He has, which my mother knitted can, for we him. We can show that one day. From the archives? That yep. can go in a from the archives section. Yeah. Okay, Jackie, off you go. Because the next <laughs> one... <laughs> yeah. So... That was our son, and now we're going to <laughs> introduce our daughter, <laughs> Daniel Hoff. I'm a bit hoarse, so I'm standing pretty revolting yes, at the moment. Madeline has, um, <clears throat> Madeline's recovering from a cold. So she's in the, from the archive section because she's wearing yet another Alice Starmore jumper and yet another famous design from Alice Darmore, and that is the Nakraga. So, I did some modifications on this too. This is the C, what did I say wrong? I said C enema. Um, yeah, it's, it's not C enema, it's C anemone. C anemone. I think that's the colourway. And it's Hebridean three ply, so the same ply as this one here. And this is probably this one looks really complicated as a as a as a cable design, but it's not. And look, get down, Jack. Don't be naughty. So you've just got these basic because, and the reason why is that each panel is is pretty is a pretty simple cable. You just have to remember you do that panel, then that panel, and that panel, and these are just opposite. And then you've got a really nice plait panel here, 
And then you've got the beehive. Can you just move a little bit that way? That's great. <laughs> <laughs> but you've also got the beehive here. You've got the, exactly. So oh. Then you've got the beehive here, which is a great one for sticking your fingers into. Mm -hmm. It feels really cosy, doesn't it? <laughs> yes. That's what I did all the time when I was knitting it, is stick my fingers into it. Okay, and you wear this almost every day, don't you? Yeah, it's because it doesn't get smelly, which is very practical. It's 100% wool. <laughs> it's Shetland wool. Yeah. And it's not scratchy either, is it? Like you've no, got it on your bare skin here. Yeah. yeah. And so I did some modifications. I knitted this one after I knitted Andrew's, and I was so impressed with this design of having a, a um, plait as the collar so that I changed this one and I put a plait around the collar of this too, which I think looks really pretty. Sit on the edge of your chair like that, and if you're really still, maybe Dad can zoom in afterwards and see the collar. But it's the same plait as what goes down here and here. So I changed that. And again, I did a, put your arm up for me. I did a modified um, drop shoulder. So normally the drop shoulder is meant to go down here and you end up with a whole lot more bulk under the arm. And I didn't want that and Madeline didn't want it. You like bulky jumpers, but you don't want it too bulky. Right. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I did a modified one where I just cast off uh, I've got the details of exactly what I did. This is from the archive, so I can't quite remember. But it's on my Ravelry page, Fruity Knitting, and look up Nakraga. So cast off and then straight up there. And this is a size small. And another little, I'll show you, if you put your arm like that, maybe they can see. On the band, they do a twisted rib, but you don't twist the, the um, it's not actually a twisted, it's a cable. But the cable pattern just swiggles like a snake from right to left on top. And I'd never done that before. And I think it's a really neat design. It's really beautiful. So you've got that on the, the cuffs and you've got it here on the, on the band. And you were meant to have it. The design sh um, makes you have it here. So you've got a little bit of a stand-up collar and you have the same thing up here. But I was just so mad about these plaited collars that I did one instead. So you've now met the whole family. This is Madeline. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks Madeline. That's okay. <laughs> so the final jumper in the from the archive section is me and I showed you a little bit about this jumper before but this is um so today you've got to see the three most popular Alice Darmore designs in my opinion, but I think that's based on how many projects have been knitted up on Ravelry. And this is the Henry VIII Ferrar, and I, t oh, I love this. I can't keep telling you how much. <laughs> I love it for so many reasons, but um, I'll just tell you a few reasons now. I changed the design. First of all, it's, it's longer, and it's... Um, so the way Alice Darmore has written it, she's, she's done it straight up and down with a drop shoulder. And I wanted a set in sleeve. And I also wanted some waist shaping um, because that kind of suits my figure better. Um, yeah. She's done two versions of this one. And the first one was in the first book that I found in New York when I was maybe 29. No, I wasn't maybe 31, I was 31, what year would have that been? Around 2001, 2002, I think I bought that book. And so that was when I saw um, her original ver version of um, Henry VIII. And since then, I think she's bought out, she's got her own wool and she's changed the pattern around um, to fit her wool. And she's changed it a bit and she's changed the collar, which I think now is stunning. I totally love this collar. It looks to me like medieval jewels. If you look at the paintings of, of King Henry VIII or the Tudor period, um, you can see that their, their gowns are full of these beautiful rubies and emeralds and, you know, huge fat stones everywhere. And this here, and I'm hoping Andrew can zoom in perhaps and give you a good shot, but this here, just looks like that, like I've got a necklace of jewels on and I've got bracelets of jewels here, if you can see that. 
And then, of course, her colours. And if, maybe if you can see closely, the background um, colours change every, what's that, every centimetre the background colours and she has her, her all of her wall has a heathered look so there's multiple colours in each colour it's never a flat colour and so that they they work really well in fair isling because you can put them together and a little bit of this colour is in this colour and you can fade them in and out so her background colours are just fading so you can almost you can't even see there's certainly no lines and then you've got the the so in this golden pattern here, you've got one wall is this, and then that's another one, and then this is another one here, and of course this grey here. So I totally love it. So this was my Mount Everest, because not only is it a difficult ferrule pattern to knit, but I've put in shaping. Oh. So I have to I have to show, this is, comes into the bring and brag as well, because have a look at this. I am so happy with my shaping. Let me figure out where my shaping actually is. Where's my, here's my shaping. Okay, so you can see, and I'm, I might stand up. You know what, I'm going to stand up and I hope that this works. But you, you can see how, I'm going to stand here. So you can see how that is diminishing in like that, and that it diminishes out. So I'm not very good with maths. I, that's the, the worst thing I hate about knitting and altering patterns is getting the maths right. But once you've done that, it's it's quite a good thing. And this worked out well. So there's my shaping. And it still looks, because it's the difficult thing about Fair Isle, is if you put some shaping in, you can, you can wreck the pattern. But here, I just took this band here, and I shaped it from, from, I think this is 13 stitches wide, down to nothing, and then back out again. Hopefully, I'm, mm -hmm. I'll stand here. And hopefully you can see that. So I was really proud of that. That worked for me. And then I did the set-in sleeves. And what's important about a set-in sleeve? As you can see, the colours have to... I hope you can see it. But the colours here, or the straps here, have to line up on the sleeve. So we've got red and grey here, red and grey there. Not the red and grey up here or somewhere else. And this, and Alastair Moore patterns are so intricately written out. There's so much attention to so much detail. That's what I love about her too. It's like top end art. It's like, <laughs> I can't fault any of her writing. And that's so exciting. It's like watching some of the BBC period movies. <laughs> Cause, or some, you, you, you see the acting and you think that acting is so brilliant and the costumes are so good. I couldn't, I couldn't imagine it being any better. Not all of them, but some of them. Well, that's how I feel about Alice <laughs> And anyway, why was I saying that? Okay. So there's so much attention to detail and I didn't want to lose that by by doing the shaping and I didn't want to lose that by putting in set in sleeves because it's much harder. But the key to do it is you've got to make sure that the last row on your sleeve before you start doing the cap has to be the same row in the ferrule pattern as the last um, row on your main body before you start doing the decrease of the of, of the shaping of the arm. So just say it's 54. If you end on pattern number or pattern row 54 here, you've got to make sure that this is going to be 54. So to do that, you have to figure out how long is your arms going to be, and then um, so you you figure out okay, I've got uh, from here to here is uh, 40 centimeters. Wouldn't be 40 centimeters, would it? It'd be less than that. Yeah, but just we'll just say 40 centimeters so that means you're going to have 40 centimeters plus whatever extra long whatever extra length you need and then you've got to figure out okay so what row do I start on to get it but if you do all of those calculations well then you get this these stripes all matching up to the body stripes and it looks pretty good then your cap that's not going to match quite up to here but that doesn't matter so much you can fudge that a bit and the overall effect still is one of continuity so I was actually really thrilled with this I th and it's my Mount Everest which I've climbed 
talking about Mount Everest, just very quickly, yeah. <laughs> we are not far from Snowdon, the Mount Snowdon, because we're in Snowdonia right now. And um, Edmund Hillary apparently used to use Snowdon as um, one of the mountains that he would train on for doing Mount Everest, didn't he? Yep. Yep. And we're, uh, we're aiming to be heading out to Mount Snowden in the next couple of days, um, depending on the weather. We have been really lucky with the weather here in the past, mm. and so we're hoping for some more luck. Um, it's actually relatively warm right now. Um, I know that sounds a little bit funny when the rain is... As in there's traveling. no snow on the mountains. There's no snow. There's and no snow really on the mountains. Unusual. Yeah, but still. And we haven't seen Mount Snowden without snow, so we're hoping to get up there in the next couple of days. Maybe tomorrow. Apparently tomorrow it's not meant to rain, but it wasn't meant to rain today. Yeah. But that leads us to our next segment. And our next segment is called Extreme Knitting. <laughs> so the, uh, there's, a, there's a couple of motivations behind extreme knitting, all right? Maybe just to explain the, the essentially the point is that we like going out into the, the bush, I was going to say the bush, we don't really have bush in Europe, but out into the wildest places we can find and going out for a good walk. Wild and rugged. And if we can climb a hill, that's great. Um, we, you know, we, we have climbed Mount Snowden a couple of times and in Frankfurt we regularly go off to the Odenwald, so the, the woods in Germany, and go walking wherever we can, we can find the best walks we can find. So it's a context for us to do that and, and bring the knitting into it. Um, extreme knitting. Extreme, uh, yeah. that's right. So the extreme is the fact that we're going to go out to the, the wildest places that we can find. And, yeah, Mount Snowden is first on our, our list. And um, knit. Yeah. We may not get to the summit, but if you do, if we do, it's probably the most extreme of the extreme knitting that yeah. you'll see it's, in a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this is sort of a strong start for our extreme knitting <laughs> segment. Because it's just going to go downhill after that. We don't have such uh -huh. mountains like this uh, around where we live in Germany, but um, it's a good start and, and we'll certainly get to some nice places. Um, the other thing is that we do, you know, knitting. Um, I mean, I don't spend a lot of time knitting, but... Um, we like to get out and do something active as well. It's not, you know, we uh, in the evenings after work and whatever, then we um, will sit in front of the television and Andrea knits. But on the weekend, we like to get out and uh, be a bit more active. So When we're driving to those places, I usually get Andrea to drive and I knit. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So that's coming up. So see you there.
So we're back from our extreme knitting adventure. Um, that's actually still to come, so we don't know how that went. We don't know how many rows we got done. Or we don't whether, know if we whether survived. We, we have. We may have slipped off the edge. We may have, yes. Um, yeah, how many rows we got done. Yes. Whether our knitting got frozen. It's very exciting. Whether we got frostbite <laughs> doing yeah. our knitting. But, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Still. Me too. I hope you are. I hope you enjoyed it. So. Yeah, and, and on the extreme knitting, if you've got extreme knitting practices, we would definitely be interested to hear from you. <laughs> as We'd long as they are be, be safe, <laughs> knit, knit safely, knit safely. But mm. um, we would love to see pictures, videos. We can figure out how we can put them up. And, um, yeah, so get in touch uh, either on the comments on this video or... Okay, so I'm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Anything else? YouTube. 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 All as? All as Fruity, fruity knitting. knitting. And there's also FruityKnitting.com. Yeah. So you can reach us. So you can comment, leave a message, and please leave a message. If you enjoyed this, and I really hope you did, it would be lovely to hear from you. Yep. Um, or if you've got any comments or suggestions, that's always welcome as well. Uh, so we're going to try, this is our first episode, and we're going to try to put out uh, two episodes a month. And I've also got plans as well every month to give you tutorials. So I will take a pattern um, and teach you all the techniques that you need to know to knit a garment um, or the garment that's in the pattern. And so that'll be separate and I will try to do that at least once a month. And we've also would like to do some interviews with um, different knitters and, and indie wool designers and um, and anything to do with knitting, actually. We might, we might be able to go out and speak to some of the sheep. <laughs> nah. In, interview some North Wales sheep. Yes. Okay. How do you like your life? Yeah, yeah. Working okay. conditions. Working conditions. <laughs> so I think that's about it. I so think we're finished. If we have more than one viewer, thank you for being here. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for spending your time to um, listen to us and watch us. I hope you enjoyed it, and we really hope to see you soon. Bye. Bye.